kind of go into you, both you guys, just go into why, what got you into Antarctica, what got you into, you know, studying this continent and studying the history and obviously the, uh, the natural uh, climate and geology of the area. So, um, uh, Laura, could you move your microphone oh, a little yeah. bit closer? Yeah, sure. sorry. Is this better? <laughs> uh, you can move a little bit closer, even. Okay. That's good. Good. Uh, so, uh, I fell into this job, not going to lie. Uh, I have a master's in library and information science, um, and I had worked in the university libraries as a student. So, um, then I got a staff job when I graduated. Anyway, uh, when I got my master's of library and information science, I started applying for any possible job at Ohio State because I wanted to come back here. And I landed here on a contract job processing a polar collection right out of library school. So that was just my good luck. Um, and from there, uh, my contract job turned into a permanent position and evolved into the polar curator job. So just lucky. That's how I landed here. Yeah, uh, the Bird Center's was 60 years old last year, and so it's a very well established. It's the oldest interdisciplinary center at Ohio State, and my predecessor, Carol Landis, started the outreach program and started that part-time after she retired as a teacher and, and was a colleague of mine. And so uh, about nine years ago, I applied to, to fill the position when she retired. Ironically, um, I was really interested in the subject, but I had done work at archives and on different projects as a student at Ohio State. So I remember, I remember Laura in the interview, it was a big interview with about 15 people there, and her, she perked right up and said, oh, you've done work with archives, have you? <laughs> um, and we, I'd done the University Museum project, so I was pretty well versed in how this facility operated before I even started. Wow, and so when, when did you guys both like officially get started at OSU? Like, what year? I started, I mean, as a student, I came here in right. 1996. So I, oh, mm. <laughs> I graduated from here with a bachelor's degree in 1983. Okay, awesome. And then I, I worked in the libraries until 1990. Then I left for seven years, and then I came back. Um, and that's when I started in this position. Yeah, so before we get into actual, like, the actual continent of Antarctica, uh, I kind of wanted to ask, like, what kind of work you guys do uh, on behalf of, like, the research for the, the Bird Center. Right. So my job in particular has to do uh, actually more with people who don't work at The Ohio State University and more with people all over the world. So anybody who has an interest in the history of polar exploration and the collections that we hold here. So it's my job to help them do that kind of research. Um, we do. That's not to say that Ohio State people don't use the polar collections, but the mo but the majority of users of polar historical collections are not Ohio State University people. Yeah. So you deal with a lot of people from all over the world. All over right? the world. Yep. Yep. And uh, so, like, what 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 goes into actually? Like, let's just say I want to do a research project on Antarctica. Like, mm. what what is the process? I guess to like get access to the archives and to the to the artifacts and information. Oh, wow. Okay. So, first of all, my first comment would be Antarctica is very broad. So, let's right. try to narrow that down. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yep. First we try to get you focused. Um, but really after that, we put our our finding aids, which is basically an inventory list of what is in our collections online. And so it is my job to help you navigate that. It can be a little bit overwhelming. If you've never done research in an archives before, it, it feels right. hard. It feels heavy and it's hard. But it's really, we can really walk you through that. So once I figure out exactly what it is you're trying to do, then I can point you in the direction of what collections will inform your research. So then you make an appointment. I showed you the book stacks right. when yeah, you came in. Right, yeah, they're massive. Yeah, they're massive. So 30 feet high, we access everything by a forklift. You can't just brow walk in and hope to browse here. So we um, make an appointment, you come in, we pull the material that we think will be of your interest, and then you can get busy. You you read it. We we used to do a lot of photocopying, but now we just let people take pictures of documents with their cell phones, and right. people love that. So that's kind of how it works. In in short. And like, so what are like the what are the most researched like mm -hmm. topics? I guess you would say since you said that Antarctica, like you said, it's very broad. There's a lot of different research because it's such a large continent, and it's mm -hmm. a lot of it's undiscovered. Like. So with that, like, what, what is like the most researched 
So, topics. yeah, so there is a broad range of topics, but I can tell you that the collections that are most used here, the top three are probably the bird papers. Right. We're named for bird. This year, the Wilkins collection is hot. There, Wilkins is seeing, Wilkins is an Australian mm-hmm. um, individual, and in Australia, he's becoming more well known. And there are a lot of anniversaries related to Wilkins and his work um, in, uh, in Antarctica. So this year, I'm getting a lot of requests having to do with Wilkins and the Wilkins collection. Um, and then the third one, eh, that one varies over time. So sometimes it's the American Polar Society, sometimes it's the papers of frederick cook just depends on what's going on in the world um more things relate to antarctica than people realize oh yeah (laughs) i agree and so yeah jason what what kind of research is it that uh you do yeah so so when i was first hired the the majority of the work was what's called the broader impacts for all our federal grants so there's a requirement on national science foundation grants you communicate the science to the public and that can be through science centers, zoo programs, schools, but you have to have that as an integral part of your project. So we started out there. We've always had a, a pretty large demand for bird tours of the center. Yeah. We run about probably ten or 12,000 people through those programs. But then it expanded into research projects, educating the public about geosciences, about polar regions. So we have some online tools, Fluid Earth Viewer, which is a globe you can interact with the atmosphere. Yes. A similar one, which is a VR product. You can actually go to some of these remote parts of the world and explore them in VR on your computer and tablet. And then a growing amount of work that's both research but then applied projects with what's climate is called climate resilience. So helping people in the Midwest make their communities more resilient to climate change. Okay. And um, what do you think it is, like, uh, going back to, to Bird and Wilkins, like, what do you think it is about, I mean, their, their research was done 100 years ago, now 80 years ago. Like, what is it about that research that gets people interested, do you think? And this, I guess, is a question for both of you. But, mm. like, what is it about those two individuals and their research that is drawing people to that information? Well, I would say that, well, well, I think we know what the drive is in terms of Wilkins, right? Because Wilkins was a relatively unknown in Australia, becoming more well-known. He was on an expedition with Ernest Shackleton. And people who don't know anything about Polar have heard of Ernest Shackleton, yes. right? It's an, so It's an almost unbelievable story. Right. So he um, is connected to a bunch of different expeditions over time. So I think that people are fascinated by that period of time. They're, per- they're fascinated by what people of that time period had to go through in order to, to conduct their research, but also from a more scientific, I guess, level. Climate change is a thing. And so it, people can go back and look at the documentation that was kept by these guys. It's very different than the documentation we keep today. They can look at the photography. They can look at the written records mm-hmm. and compare that to what we're seeing now. And I think that climate change continues to drive, even if people don't really realize that's why they're interested, I think that that is a huge driver towards these historical collections. Yeah, so you think it's people just trying to get to the root of you know, climate change. It's that. I also think the other thing, which might be more um, less scientific, but people's family history is all tied up in this. So a lot of people went on these expeditions and a lot of people's people's grandparents and whatnot, they remember that. So people are really fascinated by their own history. So yeah. I think that plays into it I never it too. thought about it like that, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, I can imagine like, do you see, so you get a lot of people that just go and they're just like, I just want to see, you know, my grand, my grandpa was in this research. I want to just see what exactly they were researching. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, that's interesting. And, and mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, you can get tied up in these kind of topics just off of family. Like, you know, with anything, you know, if you're, family served in the war that may incentivize you to want to go research that specific war you know just to know get into their headspace almost and mm-hmm. exactly yeah. so there's a we get a lot of that sure when uh, you also get contributions that come you have yes. people that come to presentations and talks or hear laura discussing something and then you get people that will contribute stuff to the collection that their family had right that happens a lot yes uh, yeah that's actually i was going to ask like so yeah what, what with that like what is one example if, if you have one of like really like crazy artifact that somebody just gave you that was like, oh yeah, this is my grandfather's, this is my dad's, whatever. So the best story there, the best story, I did not pull this item because it's big, but 
um, Admiral Byrd's granddaughter gave us his fur coat. Whoa. So his parka that he wore. We have pictures of him wearing the parka. Yeah. So that's probably the best, coolest thing that we've been given. But we've been given almost everything that we get for the collection is donated to us. We do occasionally purchase items for the collection, but most of the time, materials are donated to us. Right. So uh, there's an amazing flag that hangs over at the Bird Center that was donated to us, and it was the flag that flew at Little America Base Camp in oh, Antarctica. Wow. So it's awesome. Was it an American flag? No, it is a bird uh, Antarctic expedition flag. Oh, okay. So, so oh, made so he particularly. Flag. Mm-hmm. So that item was given to us. Um, and that person found it in a closet, like he was <laughs> renting a property or something. Super weird. Um, so, but most things are donated to us. We have a collection from an individual who was a uh, dog driver. We have collections from the man who kept the cows on the expedition and all those Wait, things. Wait, they brought cows? They did. Were they trying to like raise livestock down there and see if it worked or were they just they, doing that for food? Well, they were, do, they were doing it for publicity, but they said they were doing it for milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. And it it, is. if you think about agriculture, right. we've had a lot of people really interested in this story just because of the agricultural connection. Yeah. Right, right. And, Lots of people studied the cows. Yeah, and I was going to ask, like, uh, well, I guess I'll just ask this question first, but like how much of Antarctica in 2021 is explored? Like what, mm. what, what ballpark percentage would you say? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, yeah. what you define as explored, somebody's actually like, set foot there or seen it via plane or seen it via satellite. Seen it via plane even. Yeah. Um, Not satellite. Cause like, yeah. That it, it's, it's hard to say yeah, because I and guess. how close, I mean, it's even funny to think about up until a few years ago, we had better maps of Mars than we did Antarctica. Yeah. And so one of our projects at the Bird Center, our director, Ian Howard, and a number of other universities are doing a lot of work to create really good maps of, of Antarctica. Right. But most governments don't, and most satellite platforms aren't designed to look at that part of the world. Mm-hmm. So we really didn't know in detail what a lot of it looked like. And yeah. even if a plane had flown over it, did they have photographs? There's a lot of places that were unexplored. And it's funny to think about we knew knowing more about another planet than we knew about a, what is critical right. part of our own planet. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Like, is it just because it's so hostile climate or is it just because, you know, they, they don't want to research it? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's well a few things. So it's a hostile climate. Part of the year, it's dark. A lot of our satellites have a hard time with really reflective surfaces yeah. that are white like Antarctica. You think about nobody's collecting taxes down there. It's not <laughs> contested territory. We have yeah. spy satellites. And, and in fact, it wasn't until this project came along that they were able to use data they were collecting for something else and be allowed to use it to map out and to make these models of the continent. And it's opened up a whole new era, you know, Ian Howard, our director, would call it the silicone era of exploration. You had the heroic era and the era of mechanization. Now we're entering this new era where we can use big data and satellites to see stuff in ways we didn't before. Yeah, that, and, um, like, with, uh, with this, I mean, I guess with that too, is it a lot like because of contracts? Because like I, I, Antarctica is a very complicated. And I guess you guys could kind of break this down a little bit. But like I know that Antarctica has a very like rocky history when it comes to like who owns like what sliver of the land and like and isn't it like seven different countries that signed the Antarctica Treaty or something like that? I don't remember. I think it was a few more than seven. Yeah, you might yeah, I don't remember the exact or, number, yeah. but it yeah, I think it's a bigger number than and, that. And, and like why? Why, I guess, would they, did they, like, why do you think they came, like, to that conclusion that this was the best way to do it? Because, like, I feel like now with research, I can imagine, like, getting grants and getting, like, the authorization to go down there has got to be a nightmare because, you know, there's so many different people running the same place, kind of. Um, You know, Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research is this body that coordinates a lot of this. Uh, we had to go back and look at the history of that treaty coming out of World War II right. and, and you having contested territory and figuring out a way to mutually govern a continent that really was there for scientific exploration. Mm-hmm. Um, a number of other signatories that came on after the original one signed on, but this body coordinating the research that's done and and a lot of the countries cooperate and, and either do shared research or do their research in a certain portion of the continent, largely that s- some ways maps with their historical areas work because that's right. where their bases were set yeah. up but trying to make sure they overlap and, and figure out strategically what are our areas of research. You also have to realize that so much of the continent's covered by ice that there's only certain places where rock extends above yeah. it, or you have 
life as we know it that's not microscopic and that dictates where you can work and then can you safely get there and get back yeah that's i guess the biggest question yeah so if you're going to do deep field research you're probably looking at three to four years planning in advance hoping the weather cooperates and then how many people can you have at that remote site and what's going to be the expense and the safety protocols you want to have in have place it, have either of you guys been there i have not no, no. okay i have no. a lot of, lot of colleagues who have yeah but. and what do they say about it I think outside of that, it's cold. <laughs> I think what was really enjoyable for Laura and I, we had a project a few years ago where Laura got a grant to preserve some historic footage. And we made a Pam Theodotu, who's our media expert, made Bird 1933. Whoa. And it's a movie that parallels the movie that um, Bird would have yeah. shown when he was doing a live talk. But I think what was very moving for us is to watch the number of researchers in our building that unprompted said, watching that video gave me the same feel that it's like the first time as you see the ice when you approach Antarctica by a plane. And they, they said there's just a very emotional response they had. And the way that Pam had set it up, they said I had that same experience. Yeah. That same excitement was there. Yeah, because it's just like you look over and you just see this giant world of wonder. And it's like, it's amazing because it's it's on our planet. And like you said, like we know more about Mars than we do about Antarctica. And like, 